All right, we've talked about these TTT diagrams, which are our time, temperature, transformation diagrams. Why do we bother learning about them? They can tell us some really cool things that happen as you, uh, say, quench materials. We're going to give you an example of quenching steel and how it leads to different microstructures using these diagrams. But first, we have to talk about metastable states. Again, we've mentioned this earlier in this class that metastable states means that thermodynamically it wants to form that state, but kinetically it's so slow that it doesn't actually happen. A good example is a diamond ring, right? A diamond ring at room temperature, that actually diamond wants to turn into graphite, but it's really slow, right? So it's metastable in its diamond form, okay? So these require time uh, and thermal energy typically for them to complete their transformation. And remember that a phase diagram only tells us what is thermodynamically under equilibrium, right? So it does not consider rates, your phase diagrams, okay? Um, so you can imagine quenching something from high temperature quickly down to low temperature, and at that low temperature state, it doesn't have the thermal energy necessary to escape from its metastable state, so it stays locked in there, right? And we're gonna see some examples of that with steel, right? Um, and in fact, true equilibrium structures are rarely ever achieved um, because equilibrium could take really, really, really long times. And so we end up somewhere in between in non-equilibrium states, right? And all this also means that supercooling and superheating beyond the points that are shown on your phase diagram is possible. Let's look at this in the context of steel, right? Iron carbon alloys. Remember, what we've said before is that um, there exists, when you have a transformation, a temperature, right? We'll call this T1 or T max where you get your fastest rate of transformation, right? Your transformation has a maximum at that point. But if you cool it down lower than that, it'll still transform, it'll just do it more slowly. Or if you cool it down to here, it'll also transform, but do so more slowly, right? So what sort of transformations are relevant to talk about in the steel world? Well, probably ones involving the eutectoid reaction, right? Eutectoid is when you started out with austenite, right? Austenite, let's say that you're exactly at the eutectoid composition, so 0.76 weight percent. Well, when you go through that eutectoid reaction, you end up with 0.022 weight percent carbon ferrite and 6.7 weight percent carbon cementite, right? That reaction is going to take place. So let's take a look at it in terms of a TTT diagram. What you could do is you could select any of these temperatures. Let's say you selected this one, temperature 1, Tmax, or let's say it's two, temperature 2. At any of those temperatures, you could quench it instantly down to that temperature, or as quickly as you could to that, and then hold it there and monitor the transformation rate. And what you'd achieve is a plot that looks something like this, right? The transformation begins at some point in time, it occurs, and then it finishes. And you could plot the 0%, the 50%, the and the 100% points. And then at that temperature, right, right here, for example, you could plot them with these curves. You'd have a point here for 0, a point here for 50, and a point here for 100. So you could imagine doing this for a bunch of different temperatures and generating this TTT diagram, right? So that is how you form these TTT diagrams, is by doing a bunch of isothermal holds where you monitor the transformation uh, as, a, as a function of time, okay? Now again, we've talked about the nose of the TTT curve. That's the point corresponding to the fastest rate, right? This temperature max, the fastest rate is gonna have the shortest time, right? So that would be right here in this diagram. The nose of your TTT curve for this steel alloy is right at about maybe 520 degrees Celsius or so, right? What happens though if you cool it down fast enough that it never touches that TTT diagram, right? We'll talk to that in a minute. Uh, so during this process of crossing these lines of your transformation, we could monitor what's occurring. Right here, the point just before touching this first line, so you're right there, you still have completely austenitic steel, right? It's still austenite, even though austenite is thermodynamically sta stable above this line. That's where you expect austenite to be. But we can go, actually, we can super cool it below that line for some period of time, but after some period of time, it's going to start forming perlite, right? Perlite is a mixture of ferrite and Fe3C. So it's going to form along the grain boundaries first, and it's eventually going to grow all the way through. And at this point, when you reach uh, point D in that diagram, all of your austenite has been consumed to form ferrite and cementite. So that's an example of how you could use your TTT diagram to figure out just how long this transformation takes place. And it looks like at that temperature, by 10 seconds, if you held it at 600 and whatever that is, 10 or 20 degrees, in 10 seconds, you have complete transformation from austenite to perlite, right? Now compare that to the nose of the curve, right? Right here, 
it begins at one second, and at about three seconds, it's already totally complete, which is pretty cool. So that's going to be your fastest rate, right? Now, if you cross this line at higher temperatures, right, above the TTT nose, if you do it over here, what you're giving it is lots of thermal energy. So if you give it lots of thermal energy, you give it lots of energy needed for diffusion. And therefore, the lamellar stripes in your sample are going to be thick. The thickness of these stripes that form, right, where these are different materials, where you've got ferrite and cementite, the thickness of these layers is going to be larger at high temperatures. That's why we call this coarse perlite. It's coarser grained coarse perlite. And then if you do this at lower temperatures, let's say you crossed it down here just above the nose of the TTT diagram, you're going to end up with much more coarse or fine grain materials because it had lower temperatures. Therefore, you, you weren't able to diffuse as far and so you end up with these smaller uh, thicknesses of your lamella, right? And you can see this in diagrams. On the left you have a coarse perlite and on the right you have a fine perlite where literally the difference was diffusion because you're at a lower temperature, right? All right, now let's go back to our question. What happens if you quench it so fast that you never actually touch the nose of the TTT diagram? So you quench it so quickly that you get down to right there. Well, if you held it at that 250 degrees long enough, what would happen? You'd end up in this region over here, right? So we've, they've called it something different in this diagram. You notice up here, here's the coarse perlite and the fine perlite we just talked about. This is called upper bainite and lower bainite. What's the difference between bainite and perlite? The only difference is just the thickness of those lamellas, right? Coarse perlite might be really thick, like this. Fine perlite might be thinner, like this. Upper bainite is going to be thinner, like this. And lower bainite is going to be even thinner, like that. I mean, that's, that's the idea behind it. They all form the lamellar structure. It's all just alpha and Fe3C in all those scenarios. It's just how thick they're, and we've given them names, okay? So if you hold it long enough, I and mean, it's gonna take a long time, look at that, so it's gonna take 2,000, 3, 4, 5,000 seconds, and then it will turn into that structure, but it's possible. Now let me ask you this, what happens if I go straight down, all the way down to room temperature? Well, you'll notice that there are some new lines on this diagram, and a new region. It's called MS, that's for the start of the Martensitic transformation, and then you got your 50% and 90% lines. So if you quench it fast enough, you know, before a few seconds, if you can bring it all the way down from 700 degrees, well, 727 degrees down to room temperature, so within a couple of seconds, then you will avoid the transformation of alpha to Fe3C. Remember in the phase diagram, it looked something like this. We had, right? So essentially what I'm saying is that if you cool it down, let's say we're going right down through here, if you cool it down fast enough, we know that the phase diagram says that you're going to get rid of your uh, austenite up here and you're going to form these two things, but in fact you can not form them. And instead what you form is a metastable intermediate structure called martensite. Okay? Uh, we'll talk more about that in just a second. Uh, real quick, what is spheroidite? Well, what would happen if you were really up high over here and you held this for a very long time, that's when you end up with spheroidite. What is spheroidite? Spheroidite says that these big lamella that formed, um, instead of just getting thicker and thicker at high temperatures, eventually they want to get rid of the lamellar structure altogether and it forms big globs of ferrite and cementite that are separated from one another. So it stops being a lamellar structure like this and instead you just get big globs of the different phases, hence the, the word spheroidite. And that's another type of steel, although it's a really bad one that nobody uses, right? So let's talk more about martensite for a minute. Martensite occurs, um, it's a non-equilibrium single phase region, right, resulting from a diffusionless transformation. We talked about those when we started this chapter. We said it is possible for transformation to not involve diffusion. So it's not like all your atoms have to totally rearrange themselves. Instead, what happens is a small movement, a cooperative movement of atoms. I'll show you what I mean. Um, first off, where does it happen? Between about 100 and 220 degrees Celsius. Um, this is in competition with bainite and perlite formation, so you get one or the other. You get martensite or bainite, or some fraction of both, but you can't have like 100% martensite and 100% perlite bainite. It's in competition with them, right? Um, you, have to you have to quench your material really quickly to get martensite structure. And then the mechanism is still not totally understood. We know that there's no diffusion, but it does have 
large numbers of atoms that all have to get really slightly moved via some sort of cooperative motion, right? What technically happens is you go from an FCC structure, that was austenite, it was in a face-centered cubic arrangement, and it switches to a body-centered tetragonal structure, right? Um, and really, one way to think of this is as a supersaturated version of the BCC structure. So if you look at this, zooming in on it, so here is our uh, FCC for just metal. Now, FCC with carbon stuffed in it, you've put carbon, that's these little atoms here. These are now occupying the interstitials, right? And then when you do martensitic transformation, you do this slight shift where it gets a little bit taller in one axis, and all of a sudden now this is your unit cell um, instead of what you started with. And again, if you compare that to body-centered cubic, it does look like a body-centered cubic, right? You've got your body-centered cubic, but you have now your carbons are occupying these interstitials in comparison to a body-centered cubic. Now, again, it's not just cubic. Like, this is now this lattice parameter here in that direction. We'll call that B. B is no longer equal to A, right? So it has gotten longer a little bit uh, through some sort of cooperative motion of atoms. That is the martensitic structure. What can we say about its properties? Well, let's compare perlite, which is, again, high temperature. Um, let's compare that to high temperature bainite. Compare that to low temperature bainite, so lower bainite versus upper bainite, and martensite. Here's an example of what these structures look like. A is up here. This is our coarse perlite, right? You can see how thick those grains are. B, this is bainite, much smaller grains. L this is lower bainite, so even smaller, and then martensite. The microstructures look really different, right? Um, you can see that in the thickness of the lamellar regions. Now, martensite in and of itself, if you quench it all the way down to martensite, you achieve this structure, which is body-centered tetragonal. It's actually really not a great engineering material. It's really, really brittle and hard, and it actually has some cracking. As you quench it so quickly, there was a volume expansion that produced a lot of tiny cracks in your material, and so you don't use martensite as it is. Instead, what you do is they always take martensite, and going back to our TTT diagram, they warm it back up, and then they hold it for a while. Now, you might say, oh, then you just get bainite, but it's not bainite. Bainite only comes from austenite, right? It's austenite turning into ferrite and cementite. Martensite turns into tempered martensite, and tempered martensite essentially heals some of the cracks and damage of the structure and allows for a very fine dispersion of the ceramic phase in the, in the ductile uh, ferrite host lattice, okay? So tempered martensite. Let's go ahead and compare some of these properties, right? Again, tempered martensite forms very small spheres dispersed through the ferrite phase. What would the hardness be of these different materials? From hardest to softest, martensite is going to be our hardest. Then we're going to get tempered martensite. Then we're going to get bainite. Then we're going to get perlite. And finally, spheroidite, right? So that's the order of those. And again, ductility would just be the opposite going to be spheroidite is the most ductile, but it's not hard at all. And then you get perlite is uh, less ductile. And then you get bainite, and then you get tempered martensite, and then all the way down to martensite, which is going to be our least ductile. All right. Another word that, uh, another thing we need to say about TTT diagrams is that they are only valid for a single composition, right? If you do your experiment at a different composition, you need a new TTT diagram for them. So, for example, previously we did these TTT diagrams at the eutectoid composition. How do we know that this corresponds to the eutectoid composition? Well, take a look at it. If I were to hold something at a few degrees above the eutectoid all the way out here to very long times, what should happen if I were not at the eutectoid composition? Well, if I was not at the eutectoid composition, what would happen? I'm just above the eutectoid temperature. Let's say I'm to the right of it. If I hold it long enough, what should I form? Instead of just having pure austenite, I should end up with a mixture of austenite and Fe3C. So I should see some Fe3C forming if I hold it long enough just above that eutectoid temperature. And if I was over here to the left of it and I held it long enough, I would see the formation of some ferrite, right, if I held that long enough. So let's take a look at this one. What is this? Well, looking at it, here's our eutectoid temperature just like before, right? And if I hold it for long enough just above that temperature, what do I get forming? Well, I cross into this region here where it says A plus F. That stands for austenite plus ferrite. So again, that's what we just described here. We must be slightly to the left. We're just above the eutectoid temperature right there. If I hold it long enough, I start to get alpha forming, right? 
that's what they're calling um, F here for ferrite, right? Alpha ferrite, here's F for ferrite. And sure enough, if you cool it down further below the eutectoid, now you're in this region, what should we have? Well, we know that we should have pro-eutectic ferrite plus ferrite and cementite from the eutectic reaction. And sure enough, that's what we end up with. If we come across here, all the way across, we end up with F plus P. F stands for ferrite, and P stands for perlite. We know that perlite, perlite is ferrite plus Fe3C, right? We usually call that alpha. So it's saying that you're getting pro-eutectic ferrite or pro-eutectic of this alpha phase plus that, right? These would be your three constituents, the pro-eutectic phase along the grain boundaries, and then in between you've got the perlite uh, lamellar striping. So that's an example of a TTT diagram for a non-eutectoid, that should say, composition, right? So you can imagine how would this look different if we were doing a non-eutectoid composition to the right of the eutectoid? Well, instead of forming uh, austenite and ferrite above this, it would be austenite plus cementite up there, right? So that is TTT diagrams, which uh, are really useful for telling us uh, what microstructure of steel we're going to get. We're going to do some examples now where we quench them, and we're going to see what microstructure results as you quench it at different times and temperatures.